Today we're going to be looking at Mr. Slav, specifically the nuclear-powered heart. Thumbnail says nine people have this. I've never heard of such a thing. Sounds awesome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. There are up to nine people out there walking with nuclear-powered <laughs> hearts. They awesome. have these things inside their chests, which are called pacemakers. And oh, these nuclear pacemakers batteries are a pacemaker. have okay. one extremely dangerous substance, plutonium. So why would we ever consider using such dangerous pacemakers and <laughs> how are people don't get radiation poisoning? Wait, are those people like worshipping the nuke? They're on like their knees or so? What? <laughs> For those who don't know, pacemakers are used to help people to maintain a good heart rate. Some people yes. have abnormal heartbeats and that's dangerous since having a regular heartbeat may cause stroke, heart failure or cardiac arrest. When the small thing which is called sinus node together with other biological pacemaker cells don't work properly and sends weird electrical signals, some patients may receive a pacemaker. So this device sends better signals to the heart than a biological sinus node. The first implantable pacemaker was done in 1958 to a guy named Arnie Larson. The guy first played hockey. But later his heart started acting strangely and he had even a mm -hmm. hard time getting out of bed and often fell unconscious. Sometimes his heart would stop beating, so his wife would have to punch him in the chest to unalive her husband. What? Anyway, also the unalive? first pacemaker which was implanted into this man failed in just 3 hours. Mm, now yeah. second one failed in 6 weeks. The dude received 26 pacemakers during his life, but he still managed to outlive pacemaker inventor and the surgeon. One of the reasons for such crazy amount of pacemakers was batteries with a short lifespan. Yeah, they didn't last the that long back then. The first pacemakers used mercury batteries, which had a short lifespan, and also released hydrogen gas at the zinc anode. So yeah, isotopes like plutonium. Well, I know there's a reason, like in RTGs, which are used in spacecraft, something that just provides just a tiny bit of energy because they're already in space but can last a very long time just to give you a little bit of propulsion. And yeah, something like plutonium or strontium, preferably plutonium. Strontium is a little bit more hazardous to the people that are in the vicinity since it's a beta emitter as opposed to an alpha emitter. But yeah, I could I could see plutonium. This is plutonium two thirty eight, by the way, which is a non um, a non fissile material compared to plutonium two thirty nine, which is used in nuclear power plants. Not initially, but uranium uh, uranium two thirty eight absorbs a neutron, undergoes a couple of betas, becomes plutonium two thirty nine, and that can be used in a nuclear reactor late in life. It's also used in weapons, but two thirty eight is a little different. Good rule of thumb. Odd numbers are fissile, and even numbers are not. That works about 80% of the time anyway. Having a possibility of hydrogen gas being released inside didn't seem very yeah. healthy. So later these batteries were swapped with nickel-cadmium rechargeable cells. However, the patient had to spend 12 hours each week to charge his battery wirelessly or inductively. So that kind of sucked. Thankfully, in 1972, the idea of wireless charging back then is and pacemakers could last around 10 years without a need to be constantly recharged. But that still wasn't enough. Several pacemaker manufacturers had an idea. Why don't we make a pacemaker which will outlast any patient and will have power for more than possibly 100 years? Even though plutonium-238 is highly toxic and can cause cancer, it was still used in the nuclear pacemakers. If it was released in the body, this plutonium would remain in patient's liver and bones forever. The key is, but it's very short range and short acting, so if you put it, you put it in something that it can't penetrate, then you're fine. But yeah, if it, if it got in your, it's not something you want in your bloodstream. It is also extremely carcinogenic to the lungs. Just breathing in 0.1 milligram of this stuff would be enough to cause cancer. 
However, Super heavy elements heavier than lead, that's fairly common. When it comes to other radioactive materials, things like that. Most of its radiation is in alpha decay. So if yep. the pacer is completely you don't shielded, use strontium alpha for this. particles can reach the <laughs> human body. The battery housing is actually designed to withstand gunshots and cremation. However, after further tests, it appeared that uh, cremation of the person with such pacemaker could jeopardize the casing and release a radiation. Those rates at the outside surface. Oh, that'd be something. You get a nasty surprise on cremation. Wow. Of the pacemaker are approximately 5 to 15 milliram per hour from the emitted gamma rays and neutrons. The whole body exposure is estimated to be that's that's not very much, but it's one of those that kind of add that will add up over time. That's enough that you would need a regular radiation area briefing, but not a high radiation area briefing. Approximately 0.1 rem per year to the patient, which is even smaller than the exposure we all get from background radiation. You get more from so flying. It's kind of safe. So how plutonium makes electricity? Well, plutonium 238 radiates heat. There are also two conducting points, and when there is a yep. temperature difference okay. between them, it generates voltage. This effect is called Seebeck effect. Since plutonium-238 has a short half-life of 88 years, it radiates sufficient amount of heat to power nuclear pacemaker. It also, its energy is sufficiently large, that's another thing. It's not necessarily just because of its short half-life. I mean, that means it'll decay away faster, but that's not necessarily indicative energy release. Now, plutonium emits a lot more energy than, say, uranium. And that's what he means by short half-life. I know what he's getting at, because uranium-238 has a half-life that's older than the Earth, about 5 billion years. It's insane energy density. However, the energy output is rather small. One kilogram yep. of this plutonium has 2,200,000 megajoules per kilogram, while lithium battery has around 950 joules. However, plutonium releases its heat at a rate of 0 0.57 watts per gram, enough to power so your one gram fan. is not enough to power a small light bulb. Nuclear batteries are not only used in pacemakers, but also in various space missions. These RTGs. days NASA has around 17 kilograms or 37 pounds of plutonium-238 left. During Cold War it was a byproduct of the process used to make nuclear weapons. Yes. So NASA is running out of this material now. Because 238, it's rarer to see that compared to plutonium 239 in a nuclear power plant. And also, you're going to burn away the plutonium 239 just over the, the course of a fuel cycle. It actually lengthens your fuel cycle because, again, it's fissile, so it's going to, um, it, it's just going to fission in, in your nuclear power plant and turn into, uh, and turn into fission products. They have said that they will be able to make only three batteries with what they have. Good news though, apparently USA has recently restarted production of plutonium-238 <laughs> and go. is aiming to produce at least one kilogram or 2.2 pounds. And the way you do that is a little different. You irradiate neptunium-237, which comes from reactor fuel, usually research reactor, it's a bit, it's a bit exotic. And you, you put it in a, in a neutron field, basically. And that turns into neptunium-238, undergoes a quick beta decay into plutonium-238. Here, And the one kilogram of this stuff will cost uh, just eight million dollars to make. Space people previously have used <laughs> nuclear batteries in Voyager, Curiosity, several more yep. slanders, Apollo missions and many more. Even now, Voyager 2, 45 years later, is still being powered by nuclear batteries, yeah, that'll last over a century. but with half-life power due to 238 a plutonium half-life. One battery produces around 125 watts, which is needed to power communications and other electronics. Also, the reason why solar power is not the only power solution is because it is not always available. It's getting pretty far and some away. probes like Voyager is way too far from the sun to receive enough power. The thing about solar is it's actually just like uh, any other source of radiation, because sunlight is a form of radiation. Um, it follows the inverse square law. You double your distance from the sun, its intensity drops off by a factor of four. So solar power on Mars isn't going to be as good. You're going to want to have uh, 
nuclear power on Mars. I read that one nuclear pacemaker had outlasted its hospital which bankrupted. Also it outlasted its yeah. manufacturer. So when the patient dies, it will be a weird situation where the hospital which doesn't exist, exist you have to return the plutonium filled pacemaker to its manufacturer which also is gone. Crematorium technicians who may find this in the ashes, they would actually need to contact US government yeah. called Offsite Source Recovery Program. Who knows, maybe this plutonium in pacemakers <laughs> will be reused in space missions. Anyway, the reason why so these cool. nuclear powered pacemakers fell out of fashion was the fact that lithium ion was just way easier to technology deal with marches and on. the constantly changing technologies allowed lithium pacemakers to last up to 15 years. Just one short operation and patients would have new pacemakers. That's still risky though, having a, get an I operation. I found few sources which claim that up to 600 of these pacemakers were applied. But that was long time ago and today less than 9 people have them. But still, it is pretty cool when these people can say that they are nuclear powered. That is so awesome. But yeah, it's a case of technology marches on. Lithium ion batteries have gotten a lot cheaper. I can totally understand why they aren't used anymore. But still, the idea of having something out, outlast your lifespan, not having to worry about going and getting another surgery again, that's really cool. But yeah, just like if you find any other source, uh, the paramedics, the the cremators, whoever, it's basically called the NRC, and it just it's just going to become any um, open or any open source investigation case is going to be created, and it's probably just going to be retrieved and placed in some nuclear waste disposal site, which is a shame because you could you, you could reuse it, but that was, that's probably the fastest option. And also, there's not really economies of scale with this if just nine people have these left, so it's not like you're going to see resources pooled like that. But if we did have a lot more than, than that, then yeah, I could easily see these things being recycled, being um, could be converted into use for space missions. Yeah, this is a this is a really cool piece of technology and a piece of history, and I, it's something I didn't didn't even know about. Still not as long lasting as the memory when a girl complimented us. Huh? Not sure I get it, but. <laughs> Anyway, thanks so much for the recommendation on, on this video. It's, uh, it's another fascinating thing to think about. If you had a pacemaker, would you want one of these in your heart? <laughs> Guess you could say you take nuclear power to heart. Thank you very much for watching. I'll say myself out. <laughs>